Good morning. Yes. Could you please all take a seat so that we can start uh, with day two of ECHO 5. Um, I'm Kirsten Inwe, and I'm from the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, and I'm very happy to open today's sessions. Um, before we go to the stuff we are interested in, in the science, uh, a few announcements. Um, everybody who has a poster, please put your posters over there. Um, we, today in the evening we have the poster session uh, at 6 p.m. and I hope to see all your posters. The different sessions are indicated with signs, so you should be able to find it. Um, also, during coffee breaks, use both sides. There's coffee there, there's coffee on this side, so please make sure that you use all the space that you have. Same goes for lunch. Yesterday, I think you saw there's plenty of food everywhere, delicious, so make sure that you all have a good seat and um, get that right. Um, you might have seen on the app, there is a slight change for Friday in the program, so we will have all the talks until 1 p.m., then have a lunch break of an hour, and then do the closing and the last keynote. Um, and I think that's already all from uh, the organizers. I hope I didn't forget anything. Um, I'm very happy to see so many, even on day two for the plenary, and it's a little bit early for some. But uh, I'm very happy to start with our first speaker, who will give um, Howard Bowman, who is the principal research scientist with the Institute of Marine Research here in Bergen, uh, and he's also the editor-in-chief of the ISIS Journal of Marine Science since uh, 2012. And um, he will give us a short introduction and tell us everything we need to know about the symposium special issue in the ISIS Journal of Marine Science. Morning, everyone. I think that the title is self-evident. So uh, it's always good to start uh, with uh, the mission statement of the journal, which maybe uh, people are not aware of. So the ICES Journal of Marine Science is the flagship publication of the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. The journal sinks, seeks to efficiently and promptly publish rigorous, accessible, and entertaining material that will help marine scientists in their daily work, lifelong learning, and career development and in so doing, strive to publish only articles that are signals in, I think, what we all know is an ever-increasing sea of noise in the scientific literature, uh, and be at the forefront of the international debate on all aspects of marine science, and be among the world's most influential and widely read fisheries and marine science journals. So quite a lot to live up to. So um, for those of you that follow, uh, this number, infamous number, the journal impact factor, the journal's current impact factor is 3.9, um, and this is how uh, that looks uh, compared to some of the journals uh, with which uh, we are categorized in the uh, web of science. Um, I always like to put this in a broader perspective, so the Claravates web of science currently indexes about 21,000 journals. And for those of you that strive to get into the ones at the top, their science and nature, you should be aware that there are only 35 journals out of that 21,000 that have impact factors above 40. Science and nature have about 45, which is 0.17% of all the journals indexed by the Web of Science. Um, in fact, there are only 449 out of 21,000 journals that have impact factors above 10. So really, those are the journals that, uh, well, many of your research managers might hope that you get into, but that is clearly impossible. So, you know, what can we say about a uh, strategy that is impossible? I think you can all uh, think of that yourselves. So I would argue that you know, a, a journal like the ICES Journal with an impact factor of 3.9 is in the top 14% of all those 21,000 journals, and that's quite respectable indeed. Um, in fact, the ICES Journal, as many of you may know, has transitioned in January uh, from a subscription-based uh, journal to a gold open access journal. And if we rank the journal among other gold open access journals in the three Web of Science categories in which we are categorized, 
Uh, we will be, we are first among fisheries open access journals, so we're second among marine and freshwater ecology journals, and we're third uh, among oceanography uh, open access journals. Um, in addition, uh, well, importantly, the transition to uh, gold open access journals means that the entire back archive of the journal, uh, back to uh, uh, 1903, in fact, is now uh, freely available to download to anybody that wants to read any of that content. And very importantly, uh, considering what you all probably are aware of in terms of the landscape of scientific publishing these days, there will be no change to our editorial policies, our philosophy, our criteria or procedures. So we don't intend to start bombarding you with uh, requests to be guest editors. Um, so because uh, the Equal 5 Symposium was arranged before the journal's transition to open access, this is important for all of you, there will be no article processing charges for the articles that you uh, will submit and eventually might be published in the symposium issue. They will be waived. Uh, so coming to more the nitty-gritty of what the, the journal looks like these days, we have, a growing, have had a growing number of article types. Uh, of course, uh, standard original research articles and reviews, um, and then an expanding uh, series of food for thought uh, articles, which are just what they sound like. We have the luminary series, which is uh, written, which are kind of autobiographical pieces written by senior uh, members of our community. And then we have a complementary uh, series relatively new uh, called the Rising Tides Food for Thought series, which is uh, written by uh, early career researchers giving their perspectives. And then we have the uh, Covatomist series, which is uh, kind of forward looks on a field. And the stories from the front lines are really uh, challenges faced by practitioners uh, uh, in their work. And of course, we have, like uh, every journal, a comment and reply section. If you identify a problem with one of the articles that we publish, uh, you're free to uh, tell us about it, and uh, the authors get to reply, and that exchange, we hope, will be pedagogical for the community. Um, in terms of numbers, what, 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 what does that look like for the journal? This is uh, just a year uh, going back to the mid-1990s, uh, uh, and, <clears throat> um, and then submissions. So. The journal is receiving something between uh, 550 and 700 submissions per year from 87 countries. And reminder, that's a lot more than the number of ICES countries. So uh, it cannot be said that uh, the ICES journal is just an ICES community journal. Well, it's a broader community, the entire marine science community. <laughs> OK. Um, and that, of course, is also reflected on the editorial board. Uh, we have uh, 75 uh, editors on the editorial board now from all over the world. We run what's called an empowered uh, subject uh, editor model. Um, that means that the subject editors get to take the decision, which in my view is as it should be, because they are best qualified to make a decision on a topic that's in their field of expertise. So we use something called dual editorial pre-screening. That means that I read, personally, every one of those 550 to 700 manuscript submissions, and I make a triaging decision over them. Um, if I'm unable to, because uh, the material is very far outside my fields of expertise, I'll turn it over to a subject editor, and they will do the triaging. So that's what's meant by dual editorial pre-screening. So uh, what do the outcomes of that look like? Well. Um, somewhere between 45 and 50 percent of submissions to the journals are declined uh, during that editorial uh, triaging by myself or one of our subject editors. So 50 percent are not pursued through review. Um, of the manuscripts that are pursued through review, 60 to 65 percent of them uh, end up being accepted, which is pretty good. So if you make it into the review process, you have a very good chance, uh, which leads to an overall acceptance rate of between 30 and 35 percent. Um, and that's where uh, we come back to the mission statement where we strive to be publishing articles that are signals in an ever-increasing sea of noise. We would like that every article we publish in the journal is something that you all find worth reading. Um, <clears throat> so what are the kind of characteristics? What are some of the characteristics of manuscripts um, that lead to uh, a low probability that they'll be pursued through peer review? This, these are just some of them, that it's principally descriptive studies that are absent of a clear objective or hypothesis, uh, or which are narrow in scientific scope or relevance, that uh, are studies that are based upon small sample sizes, uh, limited data sets, 
uh, for example, a low level of replication, a limited number of uh, sample dates and stations or locations, a short time series, specifically too, too short to address the hypothesis that's being tested. Um, Species-specific or regional studies that uh, may be of local importance, probably are, but are not set in a wider context nor integrated with analogous work conducted elsewhere. Um, and case studies that are confirmatory of a large body of earlier work and that do not clearly add something to the ex that extends our understanding of the field. Um, common uh, reasons for uh, rejection of manuscripts that have been pursued through review are lack of detail uh, and or clarity in the methods that prevents reviewers from fully understanding how the research was done, uh, flawed study design, uh, inappropriate methods and or statistical analyses, and interpretations that are not strongly supported by the data. And we have uh, prepared a document that you'll find on the journal's website uh, uh, simply titled How to Get Published in the ICES Journal of Marine Science that covers these kinds of things. Um, in terms of uh, handling times for manuscripts, we've been able to achieve a, a time to first decision of 35 to 45 days. That's from the date that you submit the manuscript to the time that you receive the first decision, uh, ex excluding triaging decisions that are usually taken within a week of submission. And then once the article is finalized in final form, it's two to four weeks until it appears uh, online. Um, the journal has been conducting more and more uh, promotional campaigns to help authors get their work out there. Um, so we have an editor's choice series, which is pretty much what it sounds like. Editors identify something that they find exceptionally good. Um, and then uh, the ICE, with the help of the IC secretariat, the communications team, uh, these get promoted uh, in, in text on social media and with videos uh, of the author saying a few words about what, why their work is great. Um, and then we have a complementary uh, uh, campaign for what we call hidden gems, which are articles that we've identified as uh, being actually very good and very interesting, but don't get any notice, don't get cited, don't get noticed. So we also try to help authors get those out there. Um, I guess the people in the ECHO community are quite familiar with uh, uh, the cartoonist, Bas Kohler, uh, who was present at the last ECHO and did a great job uh, documenting uh, pre pretty much, I think, every talk <laughs> at that meeting and did a, a graphic novel, ended up being a graphic novel uh, from the Fourth International uh, Conference. And uh, we, have, uh, we have pursued our connection, the journal's connection with Bass, and he does uh, these uh, cartoons to promote selective initiatives like symposium issues um, and article-themed uh, collections. Uh, we're, we've also been doing some uh, early career training, so we have uh, now a, uh, established a uh, mentoring uh, uh, program uh, for the journal uh, to train, to help train the next generation of uh, editors uh, for, for the journal or for the marine science community. Uh, the first round of uh, mentees was very successful and we're in the process of selecting uh, a new cohort. Um, and then we also do uh, ICES training courses uh, on scientific uh, writing and publishing, um, outreaches, uh, uh, events at the annual science conferences, meet and greet with editors. And uh, I think at the next year, not this year, but next year's uh, annual science conference, we'll run a reviewer training workshop. So uh, for you, the message, the last kind of messages for you about if you intend to submit to the symposium issue, Read the document, How to Get Published in the IC Journal Marine Science. Uh, clearly connect your work to the symposium's main themes. Contextualize your work as broadly as you can. Not, not, don't overdo it. <laughs> uh, be realistic. Uh, spend time on your cover letter. I read the cover letters. I do. Um, and when submitting, specify that uh, it's uh, intended for publication in this symposium issue. Uh, feel free to suggest an editor. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, I will assign it to that editor for many reasons, and uh, of course it should be somebody who doesn't have a conflict of interest with you. Um, and feel free to suggest reviewers, and the same message, don't suggest your colleagues, because we will find out. Um, <laughs> submit at any time until uh, the 30th of September is the deadline. Typically, uh, the, the, the reality is that that deadline often gets extended. I know I shouldn't say that, but uh, usually one extension. So somewhere around 30 September, within a couple of months, uh, should be your target. And the issue should publish uh, in the first quarter of 2024. Uh, we have a very good complement of uh, uh, editors here uh, at this meeting, 10 of us. 
uh, here they are. And feel free to come around and talk with us uh, about the journal, about your idea, if you have a manuscript idea that you want to submit. Um, and that's all I had to say. So thanks for listening. I think the questions really then for the coffee break, um, if that is okay. Um, because now it's time to start with the first keynote of, of the day, and this is uh, for session 10, uh, Beyond Species on the Move, Emerging Climate Change Impacts on the Spatial Dynamics of Marine Species from Detecting to Forecasting and Projecting. And I'm very happy that uh, Barbara Muling uh, will present today. She's a project scientist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, based at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Center in La Jolla. <clears throat> Her current research focuses on the distribution and ecology of pelagic fish in the uh, California current system and the broader North Pacific. She's particularly interested in how these species may respond to the environmental variability and, of course, climate change. Um, she's a member of the CLETOP a Scientific Steering Committee and also has co-chair working groups on climate change and species distribution through PISES. And Noah, I'm very happy that you present today species distribution modeling for pelagic fish in the California current system. And uh, we will have, hopefully, a couple of minutes afterwards for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for pitching up so early in the morning. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit today about some species distribution modelling studies in the East and North Pacific. Um, I'd like to start out by profusely thanking all my co-authors, without whom none of this would have been possible. Here we go. So most of us are aware that marine species are shifting their spatial distributions. This is an example showing a northward shift of red hate biomass of the northeast United States. And you can see that fishery independent surveys going back to the 1970s have picked up this gradual northward shift as biomass has disappeared from south of Cape Cod and increased in the Gulf of Maine. This is another example from the Bering Sea. And this time we can see that Alaskan place has steadily moved their center of gravity of their distribution northward through time, going back to the 1980s. You can also see a northward distribution shift in Pollock and Cod, although this has a lot more interannual variability, which is driven by some dynamics of the temperature of the bottom water. And we see that depending on their life history, some species can respond much more rapidly to anomalous conditions. This particular study looked at market squid in the eastern North Pacific, and they were able to show how very rapidly, starting with anomalous conditions in around 2014, this species expanded their range northwards into the Gulf of Alaska. And that picture on the left actually shows a bunch of market squid eggs deposited on a crab trap right in the northern Gulf of Alaska. And we expect with projected future warming that these distribution shifts will continue. This study looked at both historical trends in distribution for several species off the northeast US, as well as projected future trends. And I've shown here some examples from a cold water species in Atlantic cod and a warm water species in Atlantic croaker. And you can see that in the past several decades, thermal habitat for cod has decreased substantially in the study area and is projected to disappear further through to the end of the century. In contrast, Atlantic croaker has started to move into the study area um, as temperatures warm, which favours their distribution. And these sorts of forward-looking studies, although they have several caveats, can be really useful for the fisheries industry, for managers, um, and for fishing-dependent fishing communities, because they give them an idea of what's coming and what they might need to prepare for, which can allow adaptation rather than just reaction to conditions. However, it's not a trivial task to come up with these kinds of studies that look at future distributions. Um, every study is different, but there's a general process that we tend to follow. If we want to come up with these future distributions, we first need some observations of our species of interest. And these can come from many different sources. We also need environmental covariates that we think drive the distributions of these species, which could include temperature, could include dissolved oxygen, or some proxy for food availability. 
And we combine these in some sort of statistical framework to give us a distribution model. And once we have this model, we can apply it to projections of future conditions. And that allows us to look at future projections of species distributions. However, there's a lot of really important decision points that need to be considered when you're moving through this type of framework. I've listed a few of them here. You can probably think of many more. We could spend a very long time talking about all of these different decision points, but rather than do that in the time allowed, I'm just going to use a couple of case studies from the East and North Pacific to demonstrate the importance of some of these decisions. So decision point number one, which is often the start of your study, is what data are we going to use to actually constrain these models? So firstly, we need to acknowledge that climate change is going to lead to novel environmental conditions. Here we're looking at historical mean surface temperatures in the California current system, and then projections of future changes in temperatures from the three dynamically downscaled Earth system models. And you can see that by mid-century, projected temperatures very quickly outstrip anything seen in the recent historical past. So if we want to look at projections of future species distributions, they're going to need to be able to cope with data outside the range of anything they saw during training. And we can't really assess the accuracy of these projections made decades into the future unless we want to hang around that long to see if we were right or wrong. However, we can make use of some natural conditions as sort of a test case. And fortunately or unfortunately, we're increasingly seeing uh, opportunities to do this. Most of you will be familiar with the term marine heat wave. It refers to a period of anomalously warm conditions in a particular region of the world. And the East and North Pacific experienced a strong marine heat wave starting in around 2014, which was sometimes called the blob. You can see from this map at left that temperatures reached as much as four degrees above normal. And if you look at the Hovmuller plot on the right, you can see that these warm conditions persisted for several years. So what we did in this first case study is we built a series of statistical species distribution models for 10 years prior to the marine heat wave. We then validated these models on conditions from the marine heat wave. So these are conditions that the models hadn't seen during training. So we require the models to extrapolate. So the way we set up this study is our target species were larval and adult stages of sardine and anchovy in the California current system. We got our environmental covariates from the UC Santa Cruz ROMs as well as surface chlorophyll from ocean colour satellites. We looked at five different types of species distribution model, or SDM for short, and these ranged from very simple. We had a thermal niche model, which was just a quadratic response to SST, to very complex. Uh, for example, we had a type of artificial neural network and a couple of other machine learning models. And from these, we were able to generate predictions of where we thought animals should be during the marine heat wave years and compare those to what we actually observed. And our overarching question was, do the SDMs actually retain their skill when we apply them to these novel conditions? And the answer in this study was no. So what I'm showing here is the skill of the models measured by the AUC for the pre-heat wave years on the left and the heat wave years on the right. And for reference, an AUC of 0.5 is no better than a random guess. It's important to note that for our pre-heat wave years, we did split these data randomly into a model training and an external testing data set, but they're from the same period of time. I'm showing results here from adult sardine at the top and larval sardine at the bottom. And each of the different bars is a different type of SDM. And you can see that surprisingly, the SDMs all do fairly similarly. In fact, our most complex model, the multilayer perceptron, actually did a little worse than the others. So what exactly led to this loss of skill? Well, here I'm showing observations versus predictions for a pre-heat wave versus a heat wave year. And I'm just showing pre uh, predictions from the boosted regression trees as an example. The yellow spots are where we actually caught sardine larvae, which I'm using as an example here. And the colours are the predictions from the species distribution models. And you can see that in 2008, 
The models predict that most spawning habitat for sardine is going to be off southern and central California, and this is consistent with the observations. However, in the marine heat wave, there was a really drastic northward shift in the distribution of sardine spawning habitat, which you can see by all of those yellow spots off Oregon and Washington. And the SDM just wasn't able to reproduce this. It moved north a little bit, but just not anywhere near enough. And there's a couple of different reasons why the SDM just didn't do a good job in this case, but something that we zeroed in on is what actually happens when you ask these models to extrapolate? What do they actually do? How do they cope with that mathematically? And so that leads us to our second case study. Which SDM algorithm should we choose and should we modify it or poke it or prod it to make it a little bit more biologically realistic? And for this case study, we're just looking at adult sardine, again, in the California current system. And we have fishery independent surveys at NOAA that go out every year to sample sardine and have done for the last 20 years. However, most of the sampling takes place in US waters, and sardine themselves are distributed much further south into Mexican waters. And so if you look at the scatter plot at the top left, which is a very simple representation of the observed probability of sardine occurrence versus surface temperature, you can see that we have a relationship there. But if we compare that to the critical thermal limits of sardine from laboratory studies, which I've shown in red, we have a lot of blank space. So any predictions in the blue or orange boxes are going to be extrapolations. And we're particularly interested in the orange box because we might need to move into that box for climate change projections. You can see that this, this, the response to temperature at the upper limit is not well defined. There's a lot of scatter around that line. And so what we did was that we selected a whole suite of distribution models, different ones this time, to try and see what happens when you actually ask a model to move into that orange box. I'm showing five example models here. I'm not going to get into the details of them other than to note that the two models on the left are just out of the box, and the three models on the right, we have some ability to force the shape of the partial response. What I'm showing is the gray spots are the actual observations, the same as top left. The black series is the model's attempt to say what is the partial response to temperature of sardine distributions. And again, when you're getting into the orange box, you're extrapolating. And you can see that the models actually respond very differently when given the exact same training data. And this is important because if we take these SDMs and apply them to projections of future conditions, things start to get interesting. What I've shown here is the projected change in the probability of sardine occurrence in our study area between a recent historical year and the end of the century. So blue is loss of habitat and red is gain in habitat. And what you can see is that these models disagree not only in terms of the magnitude of future change, but even its direction. So for example, the boosted regression tree projects an increase in sardine habitat in the future, whereas our GAM with gradient boosting where we could constrain the shape projects a decrease. And we might assume that this model in the middle is probably the most biologically realistic because it was the only one that started to constrain the response towards zero when it approached the critical thermal limit of this species. But importantly, this model did not have the highest skill on the training data. So skill on the, training, on the historical training data probably shouldn't be used as the determinant for which model you decide to use in your projections. OK, coming back to our roadmap for one last case study. And this time, we're going to be looking at a common criticism of statistical distribution models. And that is that they're purely correlative and they don't properly represent mechanisms. And this time, we're going to be looking at a different species. We're going to be looking at North Pacific albacore, primarily because they have complex movement and migration behaviors in the eastern North Pacific. So we're going to start out again with a simple correlative distribution model. We used a boosted regression tree, and our input data came from fisheries submitted logbooks in the California current system. We used, again, a suite of environmental variables, but the model showed that really the most important variables were surface temperature and surface chlorophyll. And I've shown the partial response to these here in two dimensions. And each of those colored squares is where the model predicts that fisheries catches should be greater than zero. And the color of the square is what the CPUE is predicted to be. 
And I want to make sure you have this in your head, because I'm going to come back to it in a minute. But essentially, you can see the model predicts that the highest CPUE is in fairly oligotrophic waters um, within sea te surface temperatures of maybe 11 to 22 Celsius. And if we look at how that looks with a very simple animation, uh, this is every month of 1999, you can see it's a very seasonal fishery. So highest catches are in summer throughout the region. As you get into fall, the probability drops away, stays low over winter and picks up again in the spring. And this model in general had fairly good skill, so when we first built it, we were fairly happy with it. But the really interesting thing about albacore is that historically they've shown these really marked shifts in distribution. So, for example, this study by, led by Tim Frawley at the top shows CPUE as the contours with the centre of gravity of large and small fishing vessels overlaid. And you can see that in the 1970s, the fishery was concentrated in the California current between about Baja California and British Columbia. In the early 1990s, the fish, distribution of the fish moved dramatically offshore. And you can see that the centre of fishing activity was way out in the North Pacific transition zone. In the early 2000s, the fish moved back onshore again. The fishery started to be concentrated off Oregon and Washington, and it's remained in this area ever since. The availability of fish off California has also been really variable historically. This is best shown through recreational landings. You can see there's periods of time where catches are very high off California, and periods of time where they drop away to almost nothing. And I've shown data here starting in 1980, but this, actually, this pattern has been recorded back at least 100 years. And importantly, the SDM is not able to reproduce either of these distribution shifts. That is, we don't see, for example, unfavourable habitat pushing the fish offshore or pushing the fish north. And we wanted to see why this might be. What's really neat is we actually have a tagging program for albacore. It's a collaboration between NOAA and the fishing industry. This animation shows five fish that were tagged off Oregon and Washington in 2011, and a sort of a year in their life. The colour contours are surface temperatures masked to be within that favourable range as suggested by the SDM. And you can see that as water temperatures cool in the fall, the fish move offshore out in the, into the transition zone. They stay out there for the winter and they move back onshore in the spring. And they use these suitable temperatures as sort of migratory corridors to move back and forth. However, you'll notice that the fish move a lot further offshore than they would need to just to avoid cold temperatures. And these are all juvenile animals. We don't get mature albacore in the California current. So we hypothesise that this is related to foraging. And what's really neat is we actually have a way to estimate energy intake from the tags themselves. And this was shown in a study on captive bluefin tuna. And what they noticed is that when you feed these tuna a meal when they're captive in tanks, their body temperature spikes by several degrees for several hours. And they termed this the heat increment of feeding, or HIF for short. If you've ever felt like you need to take your sweater off after having a big holiday meal, you've actually experienced something similar. It's the metabolic energy required to digest what you just ate. So we looked at the temperature data from these albacore in the wild, and we confirmed that we could see these same events. And so that allowed us to look at estimated caloric intake in space and time for tagged animals. And these maps just show an aggregation across 33 fish that were at large between 2003 and 2013. And the first thing you'll notice is that where the animals were intaking a lot of calories, which is in the red squares, is pretty variable in space and time. But as the fish are moving offshore in the fall, you'll notice there's a lot of blue. So fish aren't really gaining much energy in the start of that offshore migration. So they're not following good foraging conditions offshore. It's possible they're moving offshore in anticipation of better foraging conditions in the late winter and early spring, which we see offshore in the North Pacific transition zone. So we have a lot of complex behaviours, complex movements, and spatially heterogeneous ecology in this particular species, all being completed within those broad, favourable thermal limits. So lastly, let's just compare this to what we got from the SDM. Let's now look at how albacore actually use this broadly favourable habitat that the SDM predicts. I apologise for this animation. Graphics are not really my strong point. <laughs> but hopefully you get the idea. So to do that, let's last of all just look at a couple of individual fish. This animal was at large for nearly two years. 
and each of those spots on the map shows a daily location. The colour of the spot is just the heat increment of feeding, blue being less energy gained, red being more. And you can see these fish move a long way. They can be fairly resident in the California current, they can be swimming very fast along the transition zone, they can stop and pick up different places while they're offshore. We extracted surface temperature and chlorophyll for each of these daily locations. And then we plotted these daily locations in two-dimensional space with respect to temperature and chlorophyll. You can notice a couple of interesting things. The first one is that fish don't necessarily feed better where there's more surface chlorophyll, which is probably important to note because we often use chlorophyll and distribution models as a proxy for foraging habitat. Here, that doesn't work so well. But if we compare that to that favourable envelope from the SDM, you can see that the fish is completing all of this complex behaviour within broadly favourable habitat. So the SDM really encompasses migrating and foraging behaviour and we can't really split it just from a statistical model. One more fish just for fun. This one had a very different migratory strategy. It didn't go that far offshore and when it was near the US coast, it was mostly in the Southern California current. Again, chlorophyll not particularly great at picking up good foraging conditions. And apart from a few weeks spent in the very oligotrophic North Pacific gyre, again, it's completing all of this behaviour within that broadly, uh, uh, broadly favourable habitat from the SDM, even though it obviously had a very different behaviour to our previous fish. So from this, we might conclude that the SDM best rep represents potential habitat but that fish can show a lot of different behaviours within this habitat, which probably explains how they can show those north, south and east, west shifts in their distribution, and the SDM didn't pick it up. So what have we learned? Hopefully I've convinced you that modelling decision points matter and deserve a lot of thought. There's a lot of different causes of failure or even not much biological realism in these particular models. There's a few ways we can start to address or improve them, but I'd say the primary takeaway is that you need to be hard on your models. You know them the best. You need to be able to turn them in all different which ways, poke them and prod them, and make sure that you're happy with them. They're biologically realistic before you start projecting them into the future. The last thing I would say is that climate change is here and we need to use the tools we have. And if we wait for a perfect model, we're going to be waiting for a long time. So I also want to introduce that idea of compromise, that we need to use what we have, but we need to be hard on what we have. I'd like to thank all of the wonderful folks shown here for their collaboration and their support, and also all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we have time for questions. So if you have any questions, here's the microphone in the front. I invite you to go back. Thank you. Oh, golly. That was a wonderful talk. Thanks, Thank Mary. you. Uh, yesterday, in one of the sessions, um, uh, some work from Mike Litzo showed this really uh, strong non-stationary for a lot of the marine species. And obviously, as you build these SDMs, the non-stationarity between the climate variables and the ecological species is really important. I know you touched a little bit on that, but I was wondering if you add that into the mix, you know, what is our prospect for really using these SDMs for projecting future migration patterns? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are starting to see a lot of non-stationarity in the response between a species and the environmental variable that perhaps we thought for decades was the most important driver of its distribution or ecology. And I think it comes back to understanding the mechanisms. Um, even as more of a statistical person, I'm constantly appalled by the lack of actual, say, laboratory data that we have. This like, basic understanding of biology that we need to actually determine what happens when things get really warm for this species. So, I think we need to, I guess, one, make sure that our statistical models represent biology as we understand it, but two, make sure we actually understand the biology that we're trying to represent. Thank you. Any more? Any more questions? No? I have a question. So, when you now go to the next step, so what will follow up on, on this? Uh, Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, for what we're doing at the moment, I think, well, the first step is we're starting to look a lot more at the different SDM algorithms. 
and particularly making sure we're not getting any of those wild extrapolations and partial responses for our projections. The second thing we want to do is work more with the life history folks to understand better what variables we should be using and how we can actually project those. And I guess that brings us to a third point, which is working with the climate modelers to say, you know, what's available at the right resolution for our future projections and what might we need in the future. Thank you. And uh, again, thank you for the presentation. And I invite everybody to go to session 10, which will continue after the plenaries in room two. Um, now we go to the second um, plenary speaker, uh, which is representing as well the work of session 11 on ocean deoxygenation, physical, biochemical, and ecological research advances and future needs. And I'm very happy that Laura Lesplan Lee will present here today. She's an assistant professor at the geoscience department and the uh, high. Uh, Meadows uh, Environmental Institute at the Princeton Universities. Um, her goals are really to understand how climate and ocean dynamics influence marine ecosystems and global carbon and oxygen cycles, and how these changes can in turn impact the climate itself. Her group designs and develops cutting edge numerical models from high resolution ocean models to global Earth system models and combines them with statistical tools to interpret the variability observed from space and in situ. I'm very happy that she will present today the, um, her presentation will focus on climate controls, on ocean deoxygenation, compounding effects of the hydrological cycle, amplification and natural variability. Loch. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having me today. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'd like to thank briefly my, my uh, funding agencies that allow me to do that work, and I'll, I'll mention my co-authors along the way. Um, so I'm going to talk about ocean deoxygenation. Uh, and to start, I'm just going to show a map of what oxygen uh, in the ocean looks like, and that's a map you know, in the subsurface, about 300 and 500 meters depth. And what you can see is that you have some places in the ocean, mostly mid-latitude and high latitudes that are well oxygenated, above 100 micromole per kilogram or so. But then you have places, especially in the tropics, that we call oxygen minimum zones, where you have those very low oxygenated waters. And I kind of split, and, and it's in, along my, my presentation, I'm going to kind of look at that into two things. First, a volume that I call the low oxygenated waters, about, you know, waters that are below 100 and 150 micromole per kilograms. And this is the type of habitat boundaries that is used in many large species because they get excluded um, at those uh, lower levels. But then I'm going to also talk about the core of the OMZ with like much lower uh, concentration, 20 micromole per kilograms, that excludes most of our, our, the microorganisms. And also that's where happened the denitrification, the production of nitrous oxide, which is a, a, a potent greenhouse gas. In between those two things, that's, uh, you also have the hypoxia, which is often used, the hypoxic um, threshold, uh, which is also used a lot, and I'm going to mention that too. So in the past uh, 50 years, and this is a figure uh, adapted from that a special report on ocean and cryosphere that came out in 2019, you see that in the past we have um, observed a decline in oxygen in the ocean, and that's tied to warming. As the ocean warms, the solubility of oxygen goes down, but also the ventilation, which is the supply of oxygen from the surface into the interior by the ocean circulation, is going down. And we have seen that in the observation, and our Earth system models, which, is, which are the other lines, are kind of simulating uh, a, such a decline at the global scale. And it's projected to continue, especially if you go in those high emission scenarios like the business as usual. But you know, under a very strong mitigation scenario, this could plateau. Now, this is happening. We know the ocean is losing oxygen. But what I want to focus on are the patterns and the fact that you know, knowing the global change in oxygen doesn't necessarily help understanding those patterns. And this is an observation-based estimate of those patterns integrated over the whole water column here. And you see that you have regions where you 
the observation detect a strong deoxygenation trends like the tropical Pacific where we have an oxygen minimum zone. But you see also the North Atlantic, for instance, has that kind of an expected no trend observed uh, when integrated over the, the, the full column. And I'm going to talk about those two regions specifically, so the intensity oxygenation here and look at natural variability, how that might influence those trends that we get from the observations, and also what can we think about in the future, looking at projection to the future about what will happen to the oxygen minimum zones, which is sitting there. And then I'll go uh, mention something about that absence like of deoxygenation in the North Atlantic and um, talk about some climate effects that we maybe are not really thinking about, and specifically hydrological cycle amplification. <coughs> Before I, I start, I'd like to give a conceptual framework to understand uh, global ocean deoxygenation. So oxygen in the ocean depends on two things. It will depend on the consumption by biological production, uh, by biological activity, sorry and the supply by ocean circulation. And there are two ways um, that you can supply oxygen. The first one is those like well-ventilated areas. You can see it as ocean circulation act as a pipe. It has, you know, you have those water masses enters the ocean, they act like as pipelines into the ocean and they provide uh, oxygen. In the oxygen minimum zones, however, you don't have such a direct pipe. That's why there is an oxygen minimum zones. There is a high biological productivity usually, but there is also very little supply. And the supply there goes as, you know, you can see it as a very slow mixing network with multiple sources, not a pipe, just multiple sources that are mixing together very slowly. And this is important to understand the changes and why the changes might be different between those type of regimes. Okay, so I'm going to start with some work from, that was led by one of my uh, graduate students and looking at those very strong trends that are detected in the tropical Pacific. And here you have kind of a little summary. This is the deoxygenate trend in a tropical uh, Pacific box in the upper 1,000 meters. You see we compiled 14 Earth system models that have oxygen in the last um, IPCC Summit 6 and, uh, effort. And you see that they, project, um, they, they simulate in the past uh, trends that are going from zero change to about 0 0.5, a loss of 0 0.5 micromole per kilogram per decade. Now, if you look at the observation trend that we get, it's really at the lower end. It's really the, the strongest that the models manage to capture, and that suggests, the observations suggest that our models are failing at capturing those very strong trends. However, what we shouldn't forget is that that region is under strong variability, and there is some work by Dutay et al. that suggests Pacific, the Pacific decadal oscillation, those decadal variation, um, impact oxygen. The Pacific decadal oscillation, by the way, is uh, what Barbara was showing, the fact that in the, in the Pacific you had the albacore tuna moving that was really in phase with exactly that decadal oscillation, like the, the decades, and you have that here. During the observational period for which we have oxygen, there are three phases of that Pacific PDO, um, two negative and one positive in the middle. And here I show the observation of oxygen in that tropical Pacific box. Um, once the trend is removed, so you know the trend was on the previous slide, and here I, we remove the trend, and we look at what's left. And we have those strong variation on interannual, the, the dashed line. But if we filter and keep just the decadal variation, you see usually an increase in oxygen in the region during the negative phases and then a, a decrease uh, during the positive phases. You also see that the magnitude of this, minus you know, one plus one micromole per kilogram per decade, is the same order of magnitude, even larger than the trend that we were talking about and trying to detect with the same exact data. So that, that is already telling you that it's going to be hard to trust those trends. Um, we have two ocean models that have biogeochemistry and oxygen that we have in the region, and we looked at the change that they simulate uh, in the region for oxygen. What you can see is actually on the, on the uh, changes, they have qualitatively consistent changes, however the magnitude is much smaller. Now, what I want to do is that I'm going to subsample the models the same way the observations are. And first, what you see is that it, it increased massively those peaks that you see in the background, which means that a lot of those peaks are probably in variability, but a lot of them is just badly sampled natural variability. 
Also, what you see is the decadal variation in the models double when I subsampled like, the data, which means probably there are decadal variations, but they're probably sitting between what we see in the observation that are not good you know, sampling enough and our models, which still likely underestimate natural variability. And why, why is that? It's because, well, that's the number of observations we have in that region, and only about 39% of the area is covered. And you see that in the recent decades, actually went down a lot. That's on average, it's about 39%. But recently, it's even less, which is why, you know, this is actually, I wouldn't trust anything that is happening here. Okay. Just briefly, what is happening during those Pacific decadal oscillation is that you have, this is the tropical Pacific, this would be in black the American continent, and here are the main pathway, those pipes of circulation that goes from the mid-latitude, converge very the, um, around the equator, and then you have a current that bring, um, undercurrent here that bring uh, oxygen um, eastward. <laughs> Um, and when you have the negative phases, you increase those pipes, and when you have positive phases, you decrease those pipes. And this is, cons this is supported by, this is from the models that we learned this, but this is also supported by, here I pick one uh, moorings that is at the equator, and this is the anomaly in transport um, in the data at the top, so you see increased transport during negative phases and decreased transport during the positive. The models reproduce this, although they have a, a smaller amplitude. So again, probably our models are underestimating the variability, but also the data are probably inflating that variability due to subsampling. So if I, if I wrap up on this, so that was the first figure I started from. You have, um, you know, the observation trends fall at the lower range of those models, however, when we look at the decadal variation in those same observations, they are larger than those trends that we're trying to um, detect, probably hindering that separation of the trend and the natural variation. So that thing is to take into account. Now, if we go into the future, um, there is a big question that I've been uh, really, <laughs> I would say, obsessed about in the, in the last five years. Um, it was that our, our system models are systematically projecting things that like look like this for oxygen in the future, is that they, ro they, proje they project robust deoxygenation at mid and high latitudes. The stippling means they agree. But in all the tropical oxygen minimum zones area, they have probably, a, they show maybe even a change of sign, like the increase in oxygen, but also you see that they don't agree. You have uh, no stippling. And the, what happened with that is that a lot of the literature said, well, we can't save the oxygen minimum zone are going to expand or contract, uh, and the models are, don't agree. And so can we go past that? And I think we can. And so I'm going to present here a study that was led by one of my postdoc and graduate students. Um, and we used the la latest, again, 14 CMIP6 uh, air system models that we have with oxygen. Uh, in, this is a tropical Pacific. This is just to give you a very brief, this is the observed minimum oxygen in the Pacific, and this is kind of what the model do. They represent the volume of the, uh, those low oxygenated waters, that first volume that I was talking about within 25%. The core is um, actually overestimated, which it doesn't look like it is here, but it's, you know, in depth space, it, it does. But we can still look at them. I'm going to show you why. <laughs> um, and essentially, when you start looking at the oxygen minimum zone, that's those different thresholds. So if we start with, let's start at the bottom here with those low oxygenated waters, which here I define with uh, lower concentration than 120 micromol per kilogram. You see all the models, it's a robust expansion of that volume. Like they agree on this, there is no, uh, you know, it's a clear, ex and I, I measure here the volume in Baltic seas, I find that uh, useful to give you a sense of what that means in terms of volume, it's an expansion about 500 times the volume of the, the Baltic Sea. Now, if you go at the core, those like very low oxygen uh, regions, you see that actually they contract, meaning there is a gain in oxygen in those like lower, uh, uh, it's uncertain, you know, the, the, the range of the models kind of is right there uh, against the zero line, and the change is about 50 Baltic Seas. Now, in between that hypoxic waters, which is a threshold we use all the time in our studies, hypoxic threshold at 60 micromol per kilogram or 2 milligram per liter, this is what we use all the time. 
you see that their models are just show no change because it's in between that contraction and that expansion. It's they're transitioning from contraction to expansion. If we generalize that as a function of all the oxygen threshold between you know, 0, um, 5, and 160 micromole per kilogram, you have those three regimes for the models with a robust expansion at those low oxygenated waters, a weak contraction, uncertain of the core, and in between that range of the hypoxic transition uh, with near zero change and redistribution in space. The reason for that expansion is the reduced pipes. Is those pipes that bring you know, water in are, are reduced because of global warming, and so you have less oxygen supply. And so you know, this is kind of what we expect. The contraction of the core, however, it's, it's linked to that mixing network. It's the fact that it's not because the, the ocean is losing oxygen as a whole, but you can still increase oxygen in some places by changing the connectivity in that, in that network. And that's what's happening in most models, I mean, in all models, uh, to a certain degree. They change the network and they favor the supply of upper ocean, better ventilated versus the deep ocean, and changing that relationship. And there is also probably a biological effect uh, with reduced biological demand, which would also increase oxygen. So this provides, actually, I think, a robust you know, vision of what our models are, 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 are projecting. But you do have to look at it in the right framework. Like using longitude, latitude, depth might not be the right way of looking at this. You need to use those like oxygen threshold because the models might not have the boundary of that ox you know, OMZ exactly at the same place. But if you look at them in you know, a ventilation framework, an oxygen framework, they kind of make sense. It also reconciled the past studies were saying, well, we have, it's all over the place. The models expansion, contraction, who knows? And that's because we usually use those exact threshold of 60 micromolar, the hypoxic threshold, which is right there in the middle at the transition. And so obviously, if you pick that threshold and only one, this is what you're going to get. Near zero change, models are all over the place. OK, that, that was the tropical Pacific, but very briefly, we find a similar behavior in the Atlantic and the Indian, although the thresholds are not exactly the same. Uh, and one of my students is presenting about the Indian Ocean later. So very briefly on that first part, in the, you, we've seen undersampled intense decadal variability, which impact the observations. Uh, three regimes under warming for the expansion, core contraction, and redistribution at the transition. Now I'm switching to the North Atlantic, where we have no deoxygenation. Uh, and this is, a, this is, we can see it here, but there are several studies that show that. And this is actually because if you pick a spot like here in the North Atlantic, and you look at the data in depth space, you see that's because actually the upper waters are losing oxygen. The, but right below you have a layer we call the mode waters. They are very salty waters uh, that get in, in the subsurface they actually gain or have no change in oxygen. And then below you have oxygen loss again. And so you have actually a lot of compensation in that between loss and gain. And that has been observed, but not really explained. Why would you have layers that have uh, gain or small change in oxygen? And uh, the hypothesis that I'm going to explore here is the hydrological cycle amplification that modulate the supply of oxygen and can explain some of those patterns. So what is the hydrological cycle amplification? It's something that happens in response to global warming. When you look at um, the Atlantic here, and I'm sorry, I just realized I don't have a color bar on here. Uh, this is salinity. Um, maroon or like orange kind of color are the dry, salty area where you have a lot of evaporation. And the greenish areas are where you have wet and fresh with precipitation that dominates. Now, with global warming, you have an intensification of that cycle of evaporation and precipitation, and what happens is that you have the salty get saltier and the, fresher get, and the fresh get fresher, or at least it stays fresher, but you do have some blues too. And this pattern, this is observed, so it's happening. Uh, in the past 50 years, it's been happening. Now, if we look as a, I'm taking that section in the middle of the Atlantic, if you look as a function of depth, this is the results from a reanalysis, so it's observation based, you see that that signal that you have at the surface actually translate into, go into with the ventilation pathways. You have waters, those specific mode waters that are subsurface that are getting saltier, and you have deep waters that are getting fresher. 
Okay, so we try, we try to estimate what is the impact of that? Because if you start changing salinity, you start changing circulation. If you start changing circulation, you start changing oxygen supply. So we had three experiments. I'm not going to go in detail, but you have, we have a standard global warming experiment. And then we have one where we fix the hydrological cycle. It's not allowed to change. And one where we fix climate. It's not allowed to change. And that allows us to isolate the total climate effect, and then the, which includes warming, hydrological cycle amplification, ice melt, everything and one where it's only the hydrological cycle uh, effect. And I'm going to go into those different modes. You remember you had the tropical waters, the upper waters, the mode waters, the deep waters, and in between you have those intermediate waters. And here I'm showing the change in oxygen in the model projected as a function of the change in salinity. And you see that the salty get saltier waters have almost no deoxygenation which is consistent with the observations. And you also see that the fresh get fresher have a strong O2 loss. So the density, they are, you know, they are mostly below zero, which means they are all kind of losing oxygen, but then the amplitude of that signal scales with the salinity changes. And if we isolate just the hydrological effect alone, just what the, we remove the effect of warming here, we're just looking at the hydrology, hydrological amplification effect alone, you see that actually that, uh, that hydro amplification increases oxygen in those salty waters and, de and reinforces the warming driven O2 loss in those uh, um, fresher waters. Very briefly, what is happening is that those mode waters, you strengthen that pipe again because the waters are getting denser, you, you, you increase the formation of those waters, you increase the transport, whereas here where they freshen, it actually reduces the pipe and it, you know, reinforcing the, the global warming, what we expect from global warming. Okay, so my conclusions. So I showed uh, two regions. Uh, here, I've, I've been that, over that already. Here we see some compensation in the Atlantic Ocean that was not really explained, uh, but we think that the hydrological cycle amplification can explain this. And if I want you to have three main points that I want you to take home. First, we have highly undersampled natural variability in our data, which most likely lead to strong biases in our deoxygenation trend. That's a major issue it, it's, it's, it's that we have to deal with. But there are ways to try to estimate that, as I showed. Um, also, our, our system models are robustly projecting the fate of OMZs. They agree under a high emission scenario that it would you know, have an expansion of those low uh, oxygen waters and a contraction of the core. Now it depends what you're interested in, what your question is. If you're in interested in denitrification, you're more interested in the core. If you're interested in the habitat, like boundaries, you're more interested in low oxygen water. So it depends what you're interested in. Um, and finally, we always think about deoxygenation as the direct warming effect, the fact that warming reduced oxygen in the ocean. However, there we have we start that was to understand the global, but now to understand those regional patterns, we need to think more about those indirect effects. I, I showed the, you know, the example of the hydrological cycle amplification because they will be very important for the regional patterns. So here was um, the hydrological cycle that changed the pipe, the, you know, the pipelines, but you can think about also changes those mixing network that we were thinking about that are going to be tied to changes you know, uh, in, the, in the system. And that's it for me. All our speakers are so on time, so we have uh, plenty of time for, for questions. No questions. Yes. Thanks very much, hello, exciting, stimulating talk. Uh, two questions, actually, if I may. Uh, one is the, the biasing uh, effect of undersampling. You said mm -hmm. that in your talk you indicated it might uh, lead to overestimation of the, 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 the estimation trend. But in the region, at least, yes. Mm -hmm. But how do we know? Could it be an underestimation as well? And, and second question, you still, still have, a, if you subsample the models, you have still a factor two underestimate of the uh, PDO impact. And do you have any indications about the possible cause of that? 
the fact that the models are underestimating the, the, the effect of PDO. So, I mean, you see that in the transport, they underestimate the transport changes, so they actually show the right sign of change. And I, I've looked at higher resolution models, those are like mid-resolution, kind of half a degree global models, but I've looked at much higher resolution. And that transport by, you know, in, in, at the equator it get, is, is too weak in our course models. And I think that's part of this problem, is that if, you, if we were, we need the dynamics better constrained and better resolved to get the right amplitude. Um, so I w that was for your second question. Then for the undersampling, uh, yes, I agree with you, and actually you, s you see that I, I subsampled the models and showed you the decadal variation, but I didn't do that for the trend. You know, I could have said, well, what is the trend in the model? Now, if I subsample, what would be the trend? And I didn't do that because I don't trust the trend in my model uh, enough to do that. Uh, because I don't have constraint of that trend, so I don't know what to believe to start with. Um, and so I, you know, but um, I think that would be the next step. Except I would probably take more models to have, you know, to look more uh, uh, carefully at the trends and the variability and try sampling. Also, I would try that probably in different regions, you know, but that, that would definitely be a next step to try to constrain how much are we, you know, aliasing our trends. Yes, I think there's another. Run, run. <laughs> uh, excellent talk, Laura. Um, I have a question on the PDO. Uh, do you have a sense of what are the contribution of advection, mixing, or consumption in that large variability? Yes, so actually we quantify that in the paper. Uh, it's mostly advection, that pipe again. But we have, we see a, a, a small contribution of the biological and mixing, which is very hard for us to separate in our models. Um, because it's more come out as a residual, but um, but we were able to 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 distinguish those two, and um, it's mostly advection, and then uh, biology comes next with mixing. The on those time scales, I wouldn't expect. You know, it's it's decadal. It's not like a century long trend. I'm not surprised at advection. To explain such large changes, the best way of doing that is change the pipe, not the slow mixing in the biology. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, we uh, go to our last uh, keynote speaker of the day for session 19 on ocean acidification research for sustainability. And I'm very happy to have here with us Ponyas Loke Patori, PV, in short, uh, who will present um, here for the ocean acidification community. He's a professor of uh, biological science and also leads the Center of Excellence in Blue Economy at the Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research, Kolkata, uh, in India. His research interest encompasses understanding how coastal ocean shape, biological complexity, and functional consequences on regional carbon and nitrogen fluxes, quantifying um, long-term consequences on marine bioresources and blue economy in a changing climate, as well as addressing sustainability of coastal oceans of South Asia and he is also working a lot in the science policy interface and innovations, and he leads the South Asia Regional Hub on Ocean Acidification, Sawawa, within uh, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today, I, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about the story of, of the indigenous fisher folk communities of South Asia and the kind of problems they are facing. Uh, so I'm representing them today. And I, before I start uh, sharing the story, I also wanted to very quickly highlight that uh, India has got the presidency of the G20, and there is renewed interest on um, uh, bringing ocean in the forefront and, and, and making the ocean sustainable is one of the topmost priorities uh, of the government of India, working with the G20 partners and uh, beyond. 
I today represent this uh, uh, Fisher woman from South Asia. I am representing her voice today. She has been doing fishing activities. She's an artisanal fisher, uh, fisher woman. She has learned the art of fishing from her grandparents. For last 50 years, she has been engaged in the art of fishing in the Bay of Bengal. But what she has been telling me is that in the last 30 years, the yield of fish has gone down dramatically. Uh, she has to spend more number of hours in a day to make a living. And she tells me, quote unquote, you don't understand the ocean. The ocean is changing much faster than you think. And these, um, these words have huge significance because as a scientist, uh, we look at the ocean uh, from the viewpoint of science, but for her, it is the livelihood. It is, it is what she has learned and what, is she, what she has grown up with. And she also tells me that uh, very soon she might have to change her livelihood. So this is the stark reality we are facing uh, from the fisher folk communities of South Asia. The reason for this is that there are multitude of stressors that are working on the ocean of South Asia, and therefore the changes are happening much faster than we are uh, anticipating. The irony is that across South and Southeast Asia, the entire GDP of many of the countries run on the ocean-based livelihoods. You know, we are talking about fisheries, we are talking about tourism, uh, you know, shipping. Uh, all of these, some way or other, actually depend upon the health of the ocean. And the health of the ocean in South and Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia are changing much dramatically. The, the reason for that being is that, you know, uh, this has got huge implication in terms of the blue economy. As, as this ocean health is changing, the blue economy in the region is in big trouble. I wanted to very quickly highlight that the conservative estimate of the global uh, ocean asset was valued around 25, uh, 25 trillion uh, US dollars, and it could be much higher because we don't take into account you know, uh, cultural values, educational values. So it's very difficult to quantify that. But in, in parts of South Asia, uh, the blue economy can account for almost 25, 20% 20 of the GDP. If you look at this 24 trillion US dollars, essentially, in many cases, this, this represents much higher than the sovereign wealth funds of many of the big countries of the world, the developed countries. Uh, and in Asia, 80% of the global aquaculture, 60% of the world's captured fisheries, and 90% of the world's trade route through shipping actually is being sustained because of the ocean. Uh, but the irony is, as I was mentioning, that the blue economy of this region is under immense stress, and it's in big trouble. Uh, anthropogenic stressors are affecting the coastal ocean biodiversity, and we need to act much faster as time has really run out, as I believe. Uh, I work in the Sundarbans mangrove. You know, this is the world's largest contiguous mangrove. Uh, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's a Ramsar site. And this mangrove, as you see out here in different color combinations, uh, sustains the blue economy of seven countries uh, of the Bay of Bengal region. Uh, this ecosystem is very, very unique. You know, it's, it's, it has developed in the late Holocene. It's one of the youngest mangroves of the world, uh, very strongly influenced by freshwater flow, 42,000 cubic meter per second during the summer. And in the monsoon, it can go up to 105,000 uh, cubic meter per second. So it's exceptionally strong freshwater flow. It's the GBM Delta, the Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna Delta. And what is very interesting about this system is, if you look at the suspended particulate matter, it varies between 200 milligram per liter to 700 milligram per liter, so hardly light is penetrating. Yet in this ecosystem, you find a lot of rich coastal fisheries, which is sustaining the uh, Bay of Bengal uh, countries. So we work out here, uh, and this is just one, one image to show you how really this ecosystem looks like. You know, there's diurnal tides, the mangroves, uh, you know, gets uh, half uh, submerged during the tidal regime. Uh, we 
maintain a time series site out here, the Sundarbans Biological Observatory time series, and it is just in the westernmost corner of the uh, Sundarbans. What is very interesting is uh, this actually sits in where the freshwater flow is very huge. A lot of organic matter flow is happening. Uh, so, and there is seasonal hypoxia in this region. So that's something which I wanted to highlight. So you get this, uh, you know, uh, episodic uh, nature of the pH trends that you'll find out here. And of course, the salinity also keeps on uh, changing, which is very strongly controlled by uh, the monsoonal pattern. What is interesting is when you take some of these data and try to understand against other ecosystems, you know, globally, for example, the Amazonian plume or the Caribbean Sea, uh, you know, we see that this ecosystem is very difficult to understand because, because the effect of the fresh water flow is so strong. So if you want to understand the anthropogenic carbon dioxide effect, you really need to understand the natural variability more uh, clearly. And this is something which we highlighted in a couple of papers with colleagues from Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Um, and also more recently, Ornesha, who's going to talk today in the uh, session S19, um, where she has shown that the nitrification rate actually also plays a very, very important role that influences the uh, pH variability in the region. One of the work that has come out uh, from our ongoing study is that there, there's hardly any strong correlation between the salinity and the total alkalinity. And the reason for that is the data sets on pH are rather sparse, and there are regional challenges. That's the stark reality. The regional challenges are there in terms of sharing of carbonate chemistry data sets representing the shallow coastal water. And that has to be addressed. And last but not the least, the natural variability of the pH is strongly influenced by the land and freshwater. So it's essentially a land-ocean atmosphere interaction that is happening and there's something which is very unique. Now, this ecosystem is very famous for two particular fish species, the gray mullet and the Indian herring. Uh, and uh, this is, these two species actually drive more than 1% of the GDP of many of the countries of the Bay of Bengal uh, region. So, and this particular, uh, the, the fish stock keeps on changing depending upon how the diatom population and the algal population, the dynamics, how that changes, and that ultimately have an effect on the yield of the mullet and the herring over course of time. And as a result, that has again consequences for the, for the Bay of Bengal countries, the Bimstek uh, region. Now, uh, one of the interesting things that we have been trying to kind of you know, decode or understand is uh, that what would be the responses of these diatoms uh, which are found here in the coastal Bay of Bengal uh, and under ocean acidification scenario. I'm not going to talk about it. If you want to know more about it, I would request you to listen to the talk by Arnesha Ghosh on that. But what we see is very clearly that there will be winners and losers among diatoms under uh, OA scenario. Okay, and some diatoms would, you know, would undergo changes, and some diatoms would proliferate uh, under this scenario. But what would we do mean in terms of the tropic food wave and and the decline in the commercially important coastal fisheries? Uh, that is something we don't understand and we don't know. What I'm trying to point you out is these experiments that we do, we do in more on in a control system. We can only mimic certain conditions uh, of the natural variability or the variabilities that are faced in the region. So there is a lot more uh, work that needs to be done uh, to understand what would be the long-term effects of the uh, ocean acidity coastal ocean acidification scenarios when you're looking at unique biological communities in the region. Uh, we are also doing something, what we call it as, how do we parse uh, par, you know, perception of this ocean acidification among the local communities? So this is, again, a, a series of repeat survey which is ongoing using the regional languages. And one of the interesting things that comes out is when you talk with the fisher folk communities, particularly many of them are, represent the indigenous communities in the region, they are very they well know the term changing climate. They know a rise in sea level, changing salinity. Uh, they know warming of ocean. Uh, they know that pollutants are creating a lot of problem uh, in the uh, coastal water uh, in South Asia. But when we say about ocean acidification, that terminology is something new to them. 
Uh, uh, so it tells you that the science needs to be communicated much more robustly. And when I start to, when we start to engage with them, uh, we understand that this is something which is not come out of a, you know, uh, kind of come out of a black box like that scenario. They know that all these things, all these factors together are affecting the health of the ocean and ultimately affecting the health of the livelihood. All of them tells us very clearly that there has been a significant decrease in the fishery stock in the region. And they highlight one more important thing, that many of the keystone species that are found in the shallow coastal water of Bay of Bengal are changing. And here I wanted to highlight, this is a prehistoric uh, animal, uh, horseshoe crab, mangrove horseshoe crab, which arrived before the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs have become extinct, but they continue to survive. We do not know in the next 100 years whether are, they are going to survive or not because of the actions that we are doing on the ocean health. So, so their, their um, existence is at stake. Now, what it tells us during this repeat surveys, which is again ongoing, is that the fisher folk communities, they are spending more amount of time catching uh, the fish, so more fishing efforts, and they're saying clearly that there has been a significant increase in the bycatch. And that is something because fishing gears that is available is much more cheaper now. Uh, and that is giving them the opportunity to spend more time. Of course, they have to meet the day's end. So there is a cumulative effect of all these factors that is affecting uh, on the health of the uh, ocean, including uh, from the ocean acidification. Now, how do we address this uh, challenge? I mean, this challenge of, of uh, ocean acidification. Well, the answer is not that straightforward. I would argue that one way to do is uh, we have to have very robust blue financing schemes, and we have to do innovation. This innovation must take into account local factors and regional factors. Otherwise, it will be a failed exercise. Once we are able to do that, we need to bring these two pillars together. We will be able to address, in the long run, some of the biggest problems that, that faces the health of the ocean globally, including in the global south. Uh, here is one more example I wanted to highlight, and again, this is again the work of Arnesha, uh, where, where she's shown that actually in the Bay of Bengal region, the, the anthropogenic nitrogen load is increasing much faster than we had anticipated. Okay, and it is leading to a scenario where we'll end up with more heterotrophic bacterial bloom than you are talking about uh, the algal bloom. So, and that would probably at some point of time become irreversible. So she is able to designate the regions of the shallow coastal water of the Bay of Bengal into low dean and high dean uh, you know, uh, 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 groups. And she's able to show that under low and high dean uh, you know, groups, how the coastal bacterial plankton communities and how the algal communities are going to behave. So this kind of mimicking needs to be also integrated when we do the local-based uh, ocean acidification experiments uh, when you're looking in South Asia or parts of South Asia. I very quickly wanted to highlight that to support the blue financing uh, you know, uh, uh, for the way outcomes for society, there are issues. The issues are the bankability barriers. You know, the bankability barriers are very clear. One of the issues is there is relatively low returns. If there is going to be investment, how much is going to be the return? The return, unfortunately, is very, very poor. And that is essentially, I would say, perception. That perception has to change. Uh, there are lack of bankable pipeline and aggregation. Uh, uh, long time horizon is actually an issue that something uh, is being looked in the blue financing sector. And the other issue is the siloed approaches where multi-sectoral cross-boundary solutions are needed. Last but not the least, you know, we must not forget the information gaps. When you're talking about ocean acidification, information gaps is an issue. Uh, and that is something which in some way affecting the low returns. And uh, the risks, there are risks are there, and that the non-transparent risk is something that is affecting across South and South Asia. So that in over all of these factors, somewhere or other, actually limiting the blue financing opportunities across the region. Now, 
How do we address this issue? I think one of the ways to address this issue is actually integrating the science of the way for society into regional frameworks. And again, I'm giving a very regional perspective. You look at South and Southeast Asia, there are many regional entities are there. I'm not going to go into all of them, uh, but if you look at them, the crosstalk is very rudimentary among the regional frameworks. In all the regional documents, you will see there is a conversation about sustainable ocean, okay? But if you look very clearly and go through these documents, how many of those documents talk about the ocean acidification? And what would be the implications of ocean acidification for society? I think, frankly speaking, there is none. Even the quadrilateral security dialogue that involves India, Australia, United States, and Japan, they end up just short of talking about real issues associated with the sustainability of the ocean. And I think that, and the reason for that being is very, very straightforward. Who is going to pay? Uh, you know, in COP27, we have, uh, we have seen the loss and damage fund that took shape, but here in ocean acidification, the changes are long-term, the, the societal impact's going to be long-term, who is going to pay? Where from the money is going to come? The last but not the least, we must not forget that governments in South and Southeast Asia, they run looking for short-term uh, you know, implications for, with, with respect to voters, what the voters want for short-term. They don't look at the long-term implications what the voters want. So therefore, the approach needs to change. It has to start from a bottom-up approach. The local and the indigenous voices needs to communicate more strongly, and I think the civil society organizations, regional entities, you know, uh, science-based uh, outputs needs to integrate more effectively with the uh, regional frameworks. And once that does happen, I believe that there are existing blue finance mechanisms which can be used uh, to tackle OA, uh, and uh, uh, the regional frameworks will become a very, very important one. For example, impact investments. Uh, we know that there are ocean financing impact funds are there. We need to uh, integrate some of the outcomes of the OA science into policy and shape or influence the impact investments. Innovative finance mechanisms. So there is a need to actually in integrate the blended finance to tackle OA and Plastic, for example, you know, plastic is actually selling much more, and you know, in few weeks' time, there's going to be the INC2, where a lot more discussion is going to happen. Uh, the other important aspect, which is very important, uh, which, which needs to be more stressed, is the credit enhancement. Uh, there are ocean bond concepts are there. This concept needs to be integrated um, into the South-South framework. Uh, the blue carbon credits are very critical. I think there's there's a lot more discussion is required and where from the money is going to come down. I think right now most of the money is coming down from the uh, philanthropic organizations, if I'm not wrong, uh, particularly when, I, when you're talking about OA. Uh, so one, uh, one, two, three, four, all these four points only, I think, I believe, is that you know, we, we can address this, we can make a positive outcome is by involving the voices of the stakeholders in, in developing frameworks. So the indigenous and the local communities have a very important uh, role to play. And of course, uh, it is needless to say that Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network has been doing tremendous amount of work globally you know, uh, over the years, amazing uh, network that has, uh, that has been established in a huge number of colleagues all across the world, across the regions are working and playing a very, very important role to taking the science of OA for the benefit of the society. And of course, that has paved the way for the uh, OARS program where the seven interconnected outcomes to focus ocean uh, acidification actions towards delivering the impact and benefit for uh, society. You can go and look at it. And that's, of course, being endorsed by the even Decade of Oceans program. Uh, as within this framework of the Goa on, uh, of course, the regional hubs are playing a very, very important role. And one of these youngest hub is the South Asia Regional Hub on Ocean Acidification, because uh, this particular hub is going to play a very important role in deepening the engagement between South to South and South to North. And all these hubs, some way or other, are playing a very important role in, in uh, deepening the uh, engagement. And once this engagement starts to take in place, for example, Sarwa is ultimately going to 
to play a very important role in engaging with the regional and global frameworks. I can give you one example where Sarawa at the moment is engaging with the South Asia Cooperative Environmental Program, SACEP, you know, which is essentially uh, a, a framework of the seven countries of South Asia led by India, where there's an intense discussion going on on how, how which components of the sustainability of ocean needs to be inclu included, how ocean acidification is going, uh, the effect of the ocean acidification is going to be funded, where from the money is going to uh, come down, is there going to be a public-private partnership to pull the resources and to support the initiative. So these discussions is going to happen and, and I believe that there's going to be strong engagement among the regional entities uh, with the SAROA. And of course, you know, you've got the global platforms and the frameworks that's going to play a very, very uh, important role in the long run. I very quickly want to end up saying that, you know, innovation has to be shared. Uh, you know, innovation cannot be unidirectional flow. You know, innovation has to take into account local and uh, regional factors. And one way of uh, sharing the innovation is actually, you know, creating opportunities to achieve the SDG goals and uh, and making sure that our uh, uh, oceans are sustainable. And of course, the blue economy is uh, sustainable. And one of the Ways to do that is, uh, again, I'm giving this as an example, is development and evaluation of cost-effective uh, sensors for measuring way across uh, data-deficient regions. These regions are huge. There is lack of data, and we need to bring in technologies which are going to be robust, which is going to be uh, you know, cost-effective. And this would also pave way for a south-to-south -south and south-to-north engagement. And I propose that we develop a hub and spoke model for sensor development and, and validation in the coastal waters of the global south. And here is one example. I put two, two images out here where we are working very closely with Panasonic trying to develop a very cost-effective sensors. But again, that's for air quality. Uh, air quality draws much more funding opportunities than uh, ocean does. But I think though the knowledge that we learn from there can be used to actually uh, implement new ideas and, and improving the way measurements. And last but not the least, I think the power of the AI and ML is very strong. There are GUI interfaces are there where we can involve citizens as scientists very actively. And here, I want to say that the indigenous communities play a very, very important role. But last but not the least, the bankability of the finance for sensor development is equally important. Where from the money is going to come down and who is going to pay the money. So. Uh, in this story, what have we learned so far? I think one of the things that we have learned so far is there is a need for deeper scientific engagements to fill up gaps of data for away. There is no doubt about it, and we already know. I think uh, we need to have more robust south to south and south to north partnership to understand the impacts of the way more locally and at regional scales. We need to empower our indigenous and, and local communities. They need to drive the initiative because they are the ones who are facing the brunt of the changing ocean. And last but not the least, how this is going to happen? This is only, can only happen when we have blended blue financing initiatives through regional frameworks that that can ultimately deliver the impacts and benefit for society uh, of a way. Thank you all so much, and uh, I'm happy to take any question if you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I see already the first person <laughs> getting up. That was a very provoking talk, and I want to talk to you about the bankability uh, aspect. So the bankability of sensors is something that people have tried, but it's, it's harder. But the question for you is, you know, of all these uh, possible innovation concepts, uh, which do you have some specific examples of innovation concepts that could really unlock some of those non-philanthropic financing mechanisms? And if not, what would be a good process you know, to establish a think tank around how to create those concepts for unlocking those. Thank you so much. I think you have asked me a very tough question, and I don't have an answer to that question, to be very honest with you. Uh, but I can, I can only tell you that we can bring in the, uh, you know, if, if, if there is going to be funding, you know, let's say somebody, uh, some, uh, let's say banking sector is going to fund, okay? Let's put an example. 
Uh, I think we need to look at what are, what's going to be the long-term benefits of that banking sector to give that money. Uh, uh, so are they going to fund innovation that uh, is going to affect them directly? That means there is, let's be honest about it, banks are going to fund only when there's going to be profit, okay? Let's not run away from the reality. So uh, I can see clearly that the commercial aspects of the ocean is something that is very, very important. And I think, you know, we need to identify, uh, I, I, we need to identify one or two of those aspects, okay? Uh, uh, to begin with, we need to engage. And I can give you one example. I have no, no shame in saying it. BNP Paribas, I am saying it openly, you know. They are, in, they are discussing very intensely, you know, uh, for specifically funding certain um, innovations which would, which would ultimately bring in positive changes, of course, but also, you know, uh, has, will have long-term implications for the fund they're going to invest. Uh, I gave you the example of Panasonic, you know, where they have made investment and we are making sensors. Of course, these are uh, sensors for measuring air quality, but we can also do the same thing for uh, the ocean, you know, or look at particular ocean variables. So I see that the opportunities are there, but I do agree that there are more limitations are there, the barriers are there, and uh, those barriers can be only broken down when we have deep engagements, and we need to convince that funding local issues are equally important than, uh, as, as to funding global issues, because, because these are all interconnected. So I think more engagement would be the way forward, if you tell me in, in a very simple uh, way to say it. Yep, thank you. One more question there. No, I'll tell you one comment, I guess. Yeah, thank you very much, very stimulating. And uh, I, I would uh, encourage uh, all of us to, to also include oxygen in this view of thoughts. And so you mentioned nitrogen loading, loading and increase in heterotrophic activity. I think that's, and oxygen is, well, we have a UN decade program of which uh, I'm one of the, the coordinators, Global Ocean Oxygen Decade, good. And there are uh, some cheap sensors already available, and there are all pretty often direct effects of low oxygen on uh, local communities via uh, fish kills, aqua farming problems, and, and I think that's another aspect to, to be viewed in concert with uh, uh, ocean acidification and other climate change, but we, we should, should take this low-hanging fruit of oxygen as well. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you, and thank you so much. I'd love to talk with you uh, after this. And as I was pointing out that the region where we work, there is seasonal hypoxia is there. Um, and we need to understand the system more clearly because there are long-term implications of that. So yes, I'm looking forward to discussing with you. Thank you so much for highlighting that. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question, but I do a comment before. I think also like your first um, point of what we have to do is like really increasing or closing the data gaps. And I think it's not only about more more measurements, it's also about making the existing data available. Uh, I think that's uh, also really one goal, I think, of the decade as well to, to move forward in that regard. But Absolutely. Yes, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I actually go away from, uh, and, and thank you very much. It was a very rich, uh, rich talk, so a lot of different aspects that uh, would be interesting to discuss. I wanted to go back to the mangroves um, and the observation that around mangroves locally, they actually serve as a, as a kind of a balancing factor to actually um, um, balance off the, the ocean acidification and also the oxygen loss. So um, it would be interesting to see how the mangrove coverage of the Sundarban area has changed and what are the concrete activities that you can actually bring back to the, to the local communities in, in reforestering these, these mangroves and at least locally um, um, work against the, the, uh, you know, the effects of ocean acidification because you would actively mitigate ocean acidification. Yep, um, thank you so much. I think I, I wanted to very quickly say, you know, Sundarbans used to have an area of almost 15,000 square kilometer. Um, over the last 150 years, that has come down to around 9,500 square kilometers. So there has been loss of mangroves. Um, of course, the importance of the mangroves and the blue carbon, uh, you know, that, that has led to a series of programs where mangrove plantation has happened. But to understand the impact of that, it's going to take another 30 or 40 years because, you know, we don't know that, how, how that's going to, uh, you know, take shape. 
But one of the things that is very clear is that despite the decrease in the mangrove cover, this system is so robust and it's able to bring positive in output in terms of the uh, in terms of blue economy, or if you look at many of the ecosystem level processes. So I think this is again a benchmark. This kind of biotope is a benchmark to understand how the mangroves are going to you know you know respond to this short term and the long term effects of the ocean acidification and of course uh, changing climate. And I just want to end up very quickly saying out here that in the Bay of Bengal the the intensity of the cyclones are going are increasing more, uh, and this is again one of the most intense hotspots where the cyclone intensities are increasing. Two big cyclones hit the region, of course, during the COVID year of 2020. Um, it is just a category five cyclones, and but because of this mangrove cover, actually the the cyclone really did not cause da much damage. So the mangrove was able to absorb much of the force of the cyclone. So. Um, we, we need to understand these ecosystems in a more holistic manner, and we need to understand the long-term uh, effects and impacts from the OA and from other variables. And I think there's a lot more to learn. Uh, and, I think, and, and as I was saying over and over again, we need to exchange thought, we need to do more cross-talking. You know? South-South and South-North partnerships are going to be very important because the lessons that we learn is going to be applicable on a global scale. So yeah, looking forward. Yep, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, and again, an applause to all the plenary speakers this morning. We will now break for 45 minutes coffee, and then I invite you all to join the four sessions we have today. Session three, Assessing Climate Change Vulnerability of Marine and Coastal Areas and Associated Communities in Room 1. Uh, session 10, on uh, Beyond Species on the Move in room two, the ocean deoxygenation session in room four, and the uh, ocean acidification session in room three, I think. Yes, in room three. So welcome you all back at 11. Thank you. <laughs>